on Prime Crime Tonight, the mystery surrounding a young mother. There is nothing that happened. She was not with us. Disturbing secrets come to light. Just had what is probably the most erotic experience I've had in my entire life. And an ending so shocking it haunts people to this day. But I think I need help right away. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and welcome to Prime Crime Tonight. This is where we do a deeper dive into the most high-profile and memorable true crime cases. Tonight, a beautiful family torn apart by devastation. It's kind of blurred, actually. I'm just kidding. You're blocking the light. Oh, no wonder. Josh Powell and Susan Cox's story began like many others. A young couple falls in love and decides to wed in 2001. They move to West Valley City, Utah, and then welcome the births of their two precious boys, Charlie and Brayden. While on the outside, everything may have appeared to be picture perfect, the cracks began to show. We saw red um, flags. We felt he was very uh, domineering or spoke so much. We felt the red flags, but not as real serious in the very beginning. It, it, as the time went on, we felt there could be some problems. I think a good way to describe it is we saw the tip of the iceberg, and we had no idea how much more iceberg there was underwater. Susan confided in her friends about her fights with Josh and how she wished the two could seek counseling. In a letter to loved ones dated June 28, 2008, Susan would reveal a darker side to her husband, explaining that she no longer trusts him and warned how if something happened to her, it may not be an accident, even if it may look like one. The next month, Susan records an eerie video. Uh, this is me, July 29, 2008. It is 1233 Mountain Time. Um, covering all my bases, making sure that if something happens to me or my family or all of us that our assets are documented. Hope everything works out and we're all happy and live happily ever after as much as that's possible. On December 6, 2009, after attending church services and spending time with her neighbor, at around 5 p.m., Susan decides to lie down for a nap after reportedly not feeling well. Josh would say he and his boys went out to go sledding. This would be the last time anyone outside of that house saw Susan again. In the very beginning, I didn't realize how serious it was. And within three or four days of her missing, they felt it was a homicide. And then I realized that this was really happening. When Charlie and Brayden aren't dropped off the next morning for daycare, police are contacted. Law enforcement burst into the Powell home and discover no one is there. The crime scene was interesting because when the police came in, they found an attempted cleanup of blood on the floor near a couch. They saw fans blowing in order to dry the blood. They saw her purse was in the house with her wallet and her keys were later discovered. A few hours later, Josh and the boys returned home. He claims the three traveled 25 miles away for a camping trip in the desert along the Pony Express Trail, which is odd considering the frigid temperatures at the time. Even stranger, Josh had Susan's phone on him with the SIM card removed. During questioning at the West Valley Police Station, Josh adamantly tells investigators he doesn't know where Susan is. But in another room, a detective speaks to young Charlie. He says Susan came with them on the trip, but didn't come back. So your mom stayed at the park. Yeah. Where did she stay at the park? Um, she, Do you know where? She stayed at the National National Park. Do you know where at the park? No? No. She, my mom stayed where a crystal are. It's not entirely clear what Charlie was referring to, or if he was just using his imagination. 
One theory is that perhaps Charlie was referencing the Dugway geode beds, an area filled with specialized rocks that contain crystals. Not only had the Powell family actually visited this location a year earlier, but curiously, it's also near where Josh says he and the boys had camped out. One of our detectives just uh, interviewed your children, and uh, your children are telling our detectives that uh, mom went with you guys last night. And then she didn't come back. She did not go with us. Yeah. Well, with that, just getting that information, you're not going to go anywhere. I'm not going to let you leave. There is nothing that happened. She was not with us. And if my kids said that. So your kids lie then? Do your kids lie? Sometimes they do. I mean, if they said that she was with us, they know that's not true. So if they, and say if they said that she was with us, then, then I guess what? that would put her out in the out the, the Pony Express. Okay, and that's my concern. Investigators conduct a search of the desert, but find no evidence that Josh and the boys went camping. Yet there was a mine located 30 miles away that reportedly was doused in gasoline and set on fire. Interestingly, Josh allegedly told a work colleague on a previous occasion that the best place to dispose of a body is down a mine shaft. I believe Josh killed Susan because he wanted an easy way out. The relationship was suffering. She had already conveyed to family members that there was no more romantic interest. He didn't touch her. He didn't hold hands with her. There was nothing happening physically in their relationship. There was a lot of infighting. And I believe that was an easy way out for him instead of dealing with the fuss of child custody and child support. Susan's body has never been recovered. Whatever happened that night, he got rid of her and uh, he, he was adamant that, well, I did, I wouldn't kill her. I didn't, I don't know, which, uh, you know, I don't believe for a minute. I know that had he not drugged her or poisoned her, that and even one-on-one, -on -one, it had been a, the neighbors would have called in. Suspicions didn't fall on Josh alone. I think Josh had help from his family. Uh, I know his brother Michael had helped him. I didn't know that at the time. I thought it was probably Steve and Josh together. Police believe Josh's brother Michael may have played a role in disposing of Susan's remains, especially after a cadaver dog picked up the presence of human decomposition in his trunk. But further tests were not definitive. In 2013, Michael committed suicide. Josh's father, Stephen Powell, is a whole other story. In the years after Susan's disappearance, Stephen and Josh would conduct a smear campaign against her, claiming she ran off with another man and threatening to release her diaries. But in 2011, the truth behind Stephen Powell came out as he was arrested and charged with voyeurism and child pornography. Evidence collected by authorities showed Josh's father was obsessed with Susan and would continually lust after her. I just had what is probably the most erotic experience I've had in my entire life. I just, I hate to say it, I mean, of course, I haven't had that many experiences, but Susan has been feeling ill. She had a cold, and I offered to rub her feet, to rub her toes, to give her some stimulation. Started massaging her legs. I would have loved to go all the way up her legs, but I did do her calves because her feet were resting in my crotch. So I sort of rubbed her calves. Stephen's fantasies, he imagined that his daughter-in-law would reciprocate those feelings. I mean, I know she, she couldn't have missed it. She's not naive either, I know, from what I've read in her journals. Um, that girl is not naive. In a recorded conversation, Stephen eventually professed his love to Susan, but he didn't get the response he wanted. For example, when we were sitting on the couch, it just felt like you were very, um, you know, I mean, I was extremely aroused, and I think you were somewhat aroused, at least I thought. I don't know where you're going with this. But Susan, I don't, 
I think, my, yeah, well, I'll tell you what I'm wearing. I'm married to your son, and I should just be the daughter-in-law. I know. Which puts me a step beneath your own children. The scariest part? Josh and his two young sons had been living with Stephen in Seattle when Susan went missing. And then when he moved into his father's house, which is the one place she did not want her children to be because she knew about the father. I, she didn't know the depth of the father's depravity, but she knew that she didn't like the father and didn't want her children around him. After his convictions on the sex crime related charges and serving several years in prison, Stevens released in July of 2017, but dies the following year from a heart attack, taking with him any secrets he had about Susan's whereabouts. Despite motive, opportunity, and circumstantial evidence, Josh Powell remained a free man. I don't believe Josh Powell was arrested earlier simply because they did not have a body. In a lot of cases across the country, depending on jurisdiction, no body, no prosecution is kind of the rule of thumb. When we come back, the story is about to take a turn, and it's a turn that no one could have expected. This could be life-threatening. He went to court on Wednesday, and he, he didn't get his kids back. Charlie and Braden know what happened to their mother much more than they were allowed to say. And so I think Josh was afraid of that. And he knew his time was about, he was backed into a corner. Susan Cox Powell disappeared in December 2009 and her body has never been found. And as if that wasn't tragic enough, something is about to happen that changed everything. After Susan vanished, her husband Josh Powell, though never arrested, remained a person of interest in the case. Susan's parents, Chuck and Judy Cox, pleaded with the state to not allow their son-in-law to have custody over his boys, Charlie and Braden, but the state disagreed. They were saying, well, don't worry, we got this, we, we got your back, we, we're gonna take care of these kids, we're gonna help out here, but you know, we have to go toward reunification. And when they were going along those lines and it was clear that they were ignoring us and and listening to Josh and trying to work that in spite of the fact that their mother is missing, which they came out with, well, that's not domestic violence just because the woman goes missing. You take the children away from their mother and they say, well, he hasn't been arrested. He hasn't been charged. However, after Josh's father, Stephen, whom the three had been living with in Seattle, was arrested on child pornography charges, a state court took the boys away and granted the Coxes temporary custody. Josh, though, was allowed visitation. They went before a judge just a handful of times in this case. They took the kids into protective custody. They decided to allow visitation and recommend that to the judge. They didn't have to give visitation. They even found these kids in a house of horrors. I mean, they were there's a noose hanging from the ceiling. There was gallows. One of the brothers ran around naked. There was pornography all over the house. And the grandfather, who had an obsession with, with um, Susan, was arrested and the kids were taken. So they could have said no visitation at all. But they were just really trusting us and talking to us. And then they started to say things that were kind of disturbing and they were starting to remember things. Mm -hmm. And that really scared Josh. Hey, I'm on a supervised visitation for a court-ordered visit, and something really weird has happened. The kids went into the house, and the parent, the biological parent, whose name is Josh Powell, will not let me in the door. What should I do? What's the address? It's 8119, and I, I think it's 89th. Um, I, I don't know what the address is. Okay. That's pretty important for me to know. Social worker Elizabeth Griffin Hall, who was contracted by the Department of Social and Health Services, brings seven-year-old Charlie and five-year-old Braden on a supervised visit to see Josh. When the boys run to him, he reportedly says that he has a surprise and immediately locks Griffin Hall out of his house. But I think I need help right away. He, he's on a very short lease with CSHS and CPS has been involved. And this is the craziest thing. He looked right at me and closed the door. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. I'm just waiting to know where you are. Okay. The 911 operator seemed to be very callous, 
in, in a hurry to get her off the phone call, didn't have any follow-up questions regarding a lot of red flags. And I'd like to pull out of the driveway because I smell gasoline and he won't let me in. You want to pull out of the driveway because you smell gasoline, but he won't let I you... I smell... He, he won't let me in. He won't let you out of the driveway? He won't let me in the house. Whose house is it? He's got kids in the house and he won't let me in. It's a supervised visit. I understand. Whose house is it? Josh Powell. Okay. Getting so many calls over the course of a day, weeks, years, so many, so much time on the job, you start to make assumptions, and that was the biggest problem. So you supervise and you're doing the visit? Yeah, you're I supervise yourself? I supervise myself. I'm the supervisor here. Okay, how long will it be? I don't know, ma'am. They have to respond to emergency, life-threatening situations first. The first available deputy... Well, is this, is, this could be life-threatening. After Griffin Hall hangs up, Josh is home suddenly bursts into flames. And were you calling about the fire in the 8200 block? Yes, he exploded the house. Ma'am, yes, do you know the house. Okay, do you know the exact... And he blew up the house and the kids. The kids and the husband and the father were in the house. Yeah, yeah, he slammed the door in my face. Investigators would later learn Josh, Charlie, and Braden died as a result of carbon monoxide poisoning. But prior to the explosion, Injuries to the boys' necks and heads indicated Josh attacked his sons with a hatchet. All of this occurring while Griffin Hall tried to get help. She made a 911 call. That call took about six minutes. He didn't dispatch somebody for eight minutes. And after the dispatch, it took 13 minutes for the police officers to actually arrive on the scene. By that point, the house was already exploded, the children were hacked up, and everybody was dead. So the, the fact is, during the 911 call is when he should have been making the dispatch to the police officer on the street, providing the address and allowing the police officer to decide the sense of urgency of that call, not leaving it in the hands of the 911 dispatcher. The 911 dispatcher, whom Griffin Hall spoke with initially, would receive a reprimand, and he himself regretted the way he handled the call. And he said it was a nightmare for him. Well, guess what? It was a nightmare for that entire family who lost those children. It's a living nightmare for the Department of Children Family Services person who made the phone call that she's going to have to live with the rest of her life. We begged them not to let them go to that last visitation. My wife asked them, I asked them, I called up and said, he will kill them, he will kill them. And we had told them that, and they said, don't worry, we got it covered, we have a supervisor there. And then they're gone. How could Josh Powell kill his very own children in cold blood? And why at that moment? At the time, right before he killed the kids, he was being ordered to take a psychosexual evaluation and to take a polygraph because they had found incest cartoon porn on his computer in Utah. So the walls were closing in on him. He did, and he was also disallowed on a motion to return the kids. So, and he knew there'd be a polygraph dealing with the death of his wife, the murder of his wife. So it was almost like a state created danger in our mind. One time, Charlie said to me around Christmas time, of, just before they went, were killed. Anyway, he said, here's a, he had drawn me a picture of a wreath and it had a picture of his mom in the middle and said, help us find her. And he wanted me to get that to the media so that maybe somebody would start looking for his mother. He finally figured that out, that he would like to other people to help look for his mother. And, uh, I just remember feeling, oh my gosh, I hope you don't say this to your father because that would just set him off terribly. In the aftermath of this tragedy, the focus turned to Washington's Department of Social and Health Services, or DSHS, to see if this horrific massacre could have been prevented. They had basically plotted and conspired to uh, get the children back with Josh just so that they didn't have to answer those questions and, and, and deal with that parent that they didn't like dealing with. They were negligent of doing the job that they were paid to do, child protective services. They weren't protecting the children. They and then unbelievably, the state agency, CPS, who's supposed to be tasked with keeping kids safe, it's in their name, had home visitation with Josh Powell with these two boys, where the boys were also potentially witnesses to their mom's homicide. They were saying things like, mommy went with us on a camping trip, didn't come back. 
It was in a snowstorm in Utah. That was his explanation for how she disappeared when these kids were two and four. Things like mommies in a mine, drawing a stick figure of their mom in the trunk of a car coming back, etc. The Coxes ultimately filed a wrongful death lawsuit against DSHS, arguing the state agency could have saved their grandkids. A jury agreed and awarded Susan's parents a whopping $98 million verdict. All added up, I went, wow, uh, they cannot ignore this award. They can't just, you know, pay it out of petty cash or something and be done with it. They're going to have to address the issues. At the time of this recording, a judge has since reduced the payout to $32 million, and the Coxes and State of Washington are in a legal fight over the damages and a possible new trial. But one thing is clear, changes in procedure are likely on the way. Even in court, they were still arguing things that were not in compliance with their guidance. So they're oblivious to it. Eight years later, they still haven't got the message. So hopefully they're going to get the message now. In the end, we go back to the beginning. With over a decade after her disappearance, we still ask, where is Susan? My belief on why we don't know what happened to Susan is because Currently, the father is dead, Stephen. He never decided to d take a plea deal when he went away to divulge anything about the whereabouts of Susan. Josh is also dead, obviously, and Josh's brother, who was also allegedly involved, according to Josh's own sister, has passed away by suicide. So with the three people who we believe know what happened to Susan all being dead, it's, um, I believe that's the reason we don't know where her body is. The sad truth is, unfortunately, we may never learn more about Susan or why the boys were murdered. But the Coxes have made it their mission to make sure nothing like this happens again. And with that multi-million dollar verdict, hopefully, that'll be the case. That's all we have for you on Prime Crime tonight. Give us your comments on the Susan Cox Powell story on Twitter and Facebook with the hashtag Prime Crime Tonight. Thank you for joining us, and until next time, be safe.